Today's forum is the first annual forum supported by the Charles Y. and Francis N. Lazarus Legacy Fund, and the programs are being calling Recollecting, Recollecting Columbus History. The children of Charles and Francis Lazarus generously provided a gift to CMC in honor of their parents. At your places, there is an article about the Lazarus couple and their many contributions to our community. Peggy and Stuart uh, are representing the family as well as most of the rest of the table. They're right over here, let's, let's recognize them. We are presenting this forum in partnership with the Columbus Historical Society with the support of the Columbus Foundation. We also want to recognize a new sponsor, let's see if I can get this all out, Caldwell Banker King Thompson's Metro, represented by Don Bush and Keith Jennings and their associates. They are hosting the coffee and cookies, which are back today, which we served after the, uh, after the forum. Um, now on to the speakers. Information about each of our speakers is in your flyer, so I'm only going to give a brief introduction. Our first speaker is the executive director of the Columbus Historical Society. Please welcome Jeff Lefevre. Our next speaker is the director of the Columbus Recreation and Parks Department, who also has a famous brother, John, and I think the rest of the family is out there, Alan McKnight. Serving as host today is the Vice President of Physical Planning and Real Estate for The Ohio State University. Please downtown and the changes in downtown over, um, uh, over the last several generations. And I thought it'd be interesting um, to begin a discussion this afternoon by trying to um, remember downtown as it, as it was maybe um, several generations ago, 100, 100 years ago or so. And it seems like um, a, a reasonable question for Jeff that was downtown as wonderful as we really imagine it? Was it really meet me in St. Louis, Louis, um, or not? People tend to idealize or, um, you know, fantasize about our downtown being this incredible place to be in. Although we had a lot of great things there, um, what a lot of people tend to overlook is what it was really like in the late 1800s, early 1900s in any downtown. And in Columbus, Ohio, we had our own issues. Um, we had this river that's beautiful today, but in the uh, late 1800s, we had tenement housing along each side of it. Um, there's some great old Billy Ireland cartoons that talk about it and show what it, would look, what it looked like with latrines hanging over that dumped right into it. We didn't have good uh, regulations for, you know, environmental regulations, so people were open, it was an open sewer. Parts of our neighborhoods didn't have paved streets or they had open sewers too. We didn't have um, electricity or gas in the houses, a lot of times we burn coal. Um, imagine what it was like when a lot of these houses were burning coal in them. So people wanted to get away from the city. Yes, it was a center of commerce. Um, we had a lot of entertainment downtown, but for living and um, the idea was if you could, you move further out. And we can see that along East Broad Street as you see the development moving <coughs> the Columbus Foundation, or uh, Columbus Club, just over here on Broad Street, 1870s housing by late 1870s, 1890s, we're moving all the way out to where um, 71 crosses Broad Street with the East Park addition of Jefferson Avenue, Lexington Avenue, and, um, and Hamilton, replacing the old state hospital. And they continue to move further and further out to get away, to get fresher air and, and to move away. We still rode horses until the 19 teens downtown. And there are several carriage houses that are now in the center of our city where they would have had horses. Imagine what those smell like in the summertime. <laughs> Alan, I don't know if you have any insights on, on downtown or issues past. Well, I think the, um, the thing that you did see in that period, and you're talking about downtown and those issues, the, the odors and the, the, the smog and the burning of coal, but that's when you saw a lot of the early parks develop, which were just getting outside downtown. That's where folks went to to get the fresh air, you know, uh, Goodell Park is listed as our first park. 1851 was built just, just outside the downtown area. Uh, Livingston Park, uh, Schiller Park in 1867, 1884, Franklin Park. And I think as, as the uh, folks were looking how to escape that downtown, escape those uh, issues you identified, uh, that's when those parks really started developing. And there really weren't the parks in the downtown district that you see today. 
they were out in those outlying areas of those escapes. And in fact, there's some photos and stories about uh, developing parks even further out and trying to acquire land along the river corridors and so on further out of the city in anticipation of growth of the city so that they had those open spaces protected and preserved uh, for that recreational purpose. So um, one of the more interesting things I found when I looking through the 1908 mm -hmm. downtown plan um, years ago was that there were a lot of, surprisingly, it, it, it had the things you would expect. It had grand visions of you know, reaching across the river and, and white cities and, and all of that. But it also dealt with some very mundane kinds of things, like we have to do something about all the wires on the street. And there was a lot of concern about the um, railroad tracks, all the at-grade crossings and the sort of myriad of railroad tracks that were in the river, and the discussion of parkways. Was there, even then, was there an awareness of the public realm and the importance of the public realm and parks and things? Was this, was this an active part of the conversation 100 years ago as it's become today? I think so because we were also looking at health issues was one of the big things we were talking about. 1918, we had an um, influenza epidemic that comes through Columbus and kills, I forget exactly how many, but several hundred people. We actually fared better than other cities did, but it was a worldwide trend. And so we were looking at how to live healthier, um, how to breathe fresher air, you know, and, and things like that. So new technologies were coming about, new discoveries in medicines were coming about, and new ideas of what was causing these things. You know, we thought it was just the polluted air, and maybe we discovered it was the water, open sewers that were running. Um, so we realized that we had to fix that. that, that was a, um, a lot of issues with, with that kind of situation with sanitation. I think the uh, other thing, you know, the 1908, I know we're going to talk a little bit about the 1908 plan for Columbus, but uh, a couple of items that out of that 1908 plan that uh, are interesting and are still important today, but use of urban design to create an organized, efficient, livable city. So this is 1908, they were talking about those kinds of things. Connectivity, parks, boulevards, parkways uh, that provide green connections throughout the city. Uh, parkway roads that follow rivers to create pleasing drives. A lot of those things that we talk about today in the planning uh, process were really talked about back in that 1908. And I think that was a recognition of some of those issues that we needed to begin addressing those as the cities continue to grow. So let's talk about the 08 plan for just a minute because it, it in many ways did influence the city um, even though it's it, as a plan, it was, it was a vision that was very difficult to implement. It was, it was um, such, such a big vision. But it had a, it, had a, um, it had a refocusing on the river that, that in some ways didn't work, you know, and it wasn't until years later that it, that it changed. Can we, can we talk a little bit about um, the interest in the river, what it was, what it became, how the 08 plan um, maybe at least drew attention to it, and then how it ultimately changed in the 20s and 30s? Um, the thought process, one of the, I, I talk about Billy Ireland cartoons, the cartoonist for the dispatch, um, because he was a big proponent as well as the Wolf family pushing the 1908 plan to clean up our downtown. Um, the national road's coming in from the west and it's really a gateway into our city. And they are trying to figure out how to make that more attractive because like I said, if you see the old photos pre-1913 flood, you see a lot of um, you know, substandard housing for people put in that area, and it was this front door, as Billy Ireland says, I believe, the front door of our city, and we're, you know, they, wanna, they wanna look at this. They're starting to talk about, you know, there's a lot of immigration, like I said, new technologies coming about. What do we do? And really some of those first real concerns with how our cities are becoming and urban planning in our cities. Um, come about through the 1908 plan. The interesting thing part, the interesting part with the 1908 plan to me is it was a national movement. It wasn't just Columbus. Um, comes out of the Columbian exhibition in Chicago. If anybody has read the book, The Devil in the White City, um, it's all about that movement because we have new technologies. We have electricity. We have indoor plumbing now. We have you know, all of these things happening at the same time we have massive waves of immigration to our country that are creating these conditions that we're trying to figure out what to do with. Um, so that movement spreads across. We drive into it. We create this 1908 plan. Um, the story I tell about it when I talk about it on our tours is we created it in 1908. We're a political city, so we try and get it implemented. It doesn't get implemented in 1908, 1909, 1910. 1913 comes along. We still haven't implemented it, and we have what we call the Great Flood of 1913. 
um, that devastates the Franklinton neighborhood and we, oops, we can't, shouldn't probably go across that river because there's some issues with it. So we turn it into the, what we, uh, the north and south axis of Civic Center Drive and we continue to work on that today actually with the completion of the site a mile. Well, the cynical part of me says that we were founded by not the world's brightest surveyor because he picked the side of the river that was low. Okay. <laughs> but, he picked the side of the river that was low for his development, not yeah. for the state house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, other, the other cynical part of me says that the, the, one of the failures of the 1908 plan was it required the removal of a Neal House, which is where all the legislators went and drank. And everyone knows you never want to get in the way of those guys and their alcohol. Um, so. Um, so the plan changed um, in, in about the 20s or 30s, and Frank Packard flipped the plan and drove it along uh, the riverfront, uh, the Civic Center. Um, City Hall burned down, and, and City Hall gets built along the riverfront. Um, the AIU building, uh, later the Levesque Tower, you know, comes up during that period, and there's a whole sort of renaissance um, on the riverfront. And <clears throat> Alan, at the same time, I think, Parks were, um, or Suedo parks, were sort of emerging in the city, in the, in the downtown area, that um, uh, were quasi-public and things, and, and not just downtown, but probably elsewhere in the city as well. So can we talk a little bit about that? Well, I think as the uh, riverfront plan, uh, or the uh, development of the downtown, switched to that north-south axis after that 1913 flood, you know, the development of the Civic Center, you mentioned City Hall, uh, Central High School was built in 1921 on the west side of the river. Ultimately, the, the state office buildings that we see along the river today uh, and the Supreme Court building were built uh, probably more in the 50s, but the federal building, City Hall, started to create that civic corridor. You started getting that Civic Center Drive, kind of that northwest corridor up and down the river and, and really kind of focusing there. Um, it was really a little bit later, though, that we started really talking about uh, some of the more significant parks downtown when we looked at, uh, again, the Avenue of Flags in the late 60s. And really in the late 60s was when we really started looking at the trail development too as an alternative kinds of transportation to the roadway system. We started seeing uh, the first segments of the uh, Scioto Trail development uh, in the late 1960s, the Riverfront Amphitheater then being developed. So you started to see more of those kinds of developments, 50s, 60s, 70s kind of era, and started bringing some programming and folks back downtown to participate in some of those rivers. And then it, it, it grew from there. Uh, so let's, let's talk, let's fast forward a little bit mm -hmm. and get into um, an, an era that was, was not a particularly bright time for, for cities. And let's just go back a generation or two to the deep dark days of, say, 1970. And some of us here remember them. Uh, um, some of us are told we remember them. Um, the, the 70s were great for a lot of us, um, at least the parts we remember. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, uh, there, it was a tough time for cities. Um, one, one of my favorite sort of um, benchmarks for how people felt about cities was sort of the, what you would find in, in just um, popular culture songs, you know, in the heart of the city, the dirty old city. Um, and there was a great movie that I'm fond of, of uh, watching every time I see it on late night television called Escape from New York, you know, where, you know, Kurt Russell basically, um, as um, is a character who uh, is interjected into New York, which has been uh, just turned into a penal colony. You know, they just gave up on the city and turned it into a penal colony. Now that's an ultimate sort of comment on urban living um, in, in the um, 70s, but, but it was true everywhere. There had been riots in the 60s here in Columbus, and um, it wasn't a great time for cities. And um, so, you know, let's, let's talk about that a little bit, sort of, if, if we think that downtown was downtrodden, is that where it began? Is, where, is that where the image of downtown, and what sort of drove it to that? Um, <clears throat> this pattern of moving out of the city, you know, happened, you know, accelerated in the late 40s, early 50s. Um, we had issues, uh, racial issues, as we desegregated and said African Americans can move or you can't discriminate anymore based on skin color. For housing sales, you see a flight of people from neighborhoods as new people move out of their neighborhoods into them. We accelerated that with the freeway system and getting people out further. We put in strip malls and now people don't have to come back downtown to do their shopping. We kind of move these things out of in the outer quarter 
and people can go quickly through those pockets of poverty we've created in the cities, um, coming out of the riots and uh, the devastation of the buildings, some of the housing stock being you know, left abandoned because people were moving to new housing. And I think people looking back in started getting this idea of what the downtown areas were like. And we still have that today with people who don't come downtown. They don't realize what's going on. Um, they hear the reports on the news of crime and, and issues and abandonment and stuff. And so they were afraid to come back downtown. And I think it just really accelerated in this with the issues of the 60s and into the 70s um, for people leaving those areas. And then following them were the businesses and all of that stuff too. And then even entertainment. Um, Things you know, you've got the French Market and the Continent opening up in in Columbus on the outside of downtown. We didn't like our cities, so we go build. Yeah, new we ones build a new one out, like, yeah. outside of downtown. When I came to to school in the early '80s, you know, you went to the clubs that were on the outskirts of of downtown. You didn't have you know a lot of the entertainment stuff downtown really. The theaters were still there and some of those things, but you drove in very quickly and you drove out very quickly <laughs> to go out to to get home. Uh -huh. Well, I think the, what you say is right. I think the, um, there was, it was that transportation was easy, transportation was cheap, homes were inexpensive, uh, they were building those suburbs, so folks were moving out of the town, uh, out of the downtown area, and I guess, you know, we're really starting to create a donut, uh, and unfortunately that was something that, uh, you know, cities can't survive that way, and we know that today, so um, we, as, as we move forward, we started looking at how do we turn that around. You know, there was uh, uh, some efforts in programming and some development downtown to try to, to start bringing that back, but it was really kind of slow to catch on. Uh, and it's really, I think, as, as we move forward again a little bit, um, people uh, start to change their values. You know, today, we, and we talked a little bit beforehand, you know, we talked about the transportation, how easy it was to get out of town, town uh, out of the downtown area and live out in the suburbs. You know, we've really kind of turned that around some today. It's more expensive to travel. Gas is more expensive. Because of the density, it takes more time to drive back and forth. So people want to be convenient, close in, uh, and not have to deal with the traffic and those expenses and so on. So we're really starting to see some of that turn around today uh, as we move forward. So um, that brings us up to the, there's been a sort of transformation or a change from, from the, the dark days of the 70s and 80s. And, and um, all of a sudden, um, things begin to change neighborhoods around downtown continue to change. What, what, really, um, what really started things off? What, what were there catalytic projects? What, what really kind of kicked off the um, renaissance of downtown, turned it into the playground that it's become? I think it's just a perfect storm of all of these things we've been doing as a city, as a culture, and as a society, you know, as we've stop burning coal in our houses and put sewers in and we have new technology and um, the factories have moved out of the downtown area and you know culturally we've done that we've got you know environmental regulations that don't allow us to do the things we used to do that's been a big change um, we as a city have invested in our parks and our and our things you know we we tried some experiments Maybe they didn't work so much. Um, city Center, ever, anybody remember that? And it was supposed to be a big catalyst, but everybody came into City Center. I remember the lines down uh, 3rd Street going in, and then they went back out to their suburban homes. Um, and now we're trying more open things. Um, the parks with Columbus Commons keeping people around longer into the evening. Um, I think there's also a generational change, a shift. Um, we've moved away from the baby boomers who are more of a agrarian you know, roots, um, grew up more in the rural areas, and had that connection maybe and liked living out from the city. And a lot of the younger generation now have a more suburban, and we have that attitude. You know, I grew up in a we had issues in our community growing up with crime. I don't remember leaving our doors unlocked growing up. You know, we had to lock our doors and lock our cars. You know, it wasn't a horrible place I lived in. It was a small town in Ohio, but you know, it wasn't that much different from where I live today as far as safety concerns and things like that. But I have a lot more stuff I can partake of. I think too, there was a real conscious effort uh, on government's part and the city's part and city leaders to really um, re. Uh, invent downtown and to, to bring folks back into the city. As I said earlier, you don't want to have a donut. You can't have a dead downtown in the in suburban areas. You know, the whole city will suffer at that point. You know, the city took on uh, a role, and our mayor was, was talking about uh, the need to 
uh, bring back the commercial development or the commercial uh, businesses downtown. You know, we reached a point uh, back a number of years ago, 10, 15 years ago, where occupancy rates downtown were at an all-time low in the offices. You know, we've been able to bring that back. We're bringing back residential into downtown Columbus and the city and the private sector have done an awful lot to make that happen. Um, incentives and so on. I think there's a little over 6,300 residents in the downtown area today. Um, and then we've also, as you said, invested in the parks. Uh, I was looking back at some numbers and over the last 10 years there's been about, uh, uh, where is it, about 834 million in public investment in the downtown area. But that's generated almost 1.7 billion in private sector development that have come together to reinvigorate, rejuvenate uh, the downtown area. You can't come into a city and say, we're going to build parks and that's going to create a vibrant downtown. You can't come in and say, we're just going to try to bring residents downtown without those parks or those other kinds of amenities to support uh, those residents. You can't just have commercial office or businesses and offices downtown without those support kinds of facilities, the residents and the parks to bring all that together. So you, you know, you have to balance and you have to bring all these elements together to really start bringing the city back alive. And I think, as you said, there's been some changes in culture also and how folks uh, look at cities and, and the younger generation where they want to live. So you bring all those together, it is kind of that perfect storm that started to come together and really create uh, a very vibrant downtown today. So, I mean, those numbers that you throw out are, are actually fairly impressive. I mean, eight, 800 million to 1.7 billion, that's, um, those are serious numbers. And, and I think actually, if anything, um, really solidifies, in my mind, the, the notion that Columbus is one of the better fiscally managed cities that we've ever worked in. I mean, it just, um, we work in a lot of cities and or have in my previous life, and um, you just don't see that. You know, it's very unusual. Columbus is very fortunate, it is, and, uh, and we've got a good mix of business and industry in this city. Um, we're not recession proof, but I think when you look at what's happened in the last uh, 10 years, uh, Columbus has come out of uh, some of this economic situation better than a lot of cities, and uh, there's a lot of folks that have had uh, a big role in making that happen. Yeah. So um, a question about the neighborhoods. You know, we've talked a lot about downtown, but one of the unique attributes of Columbus, you know, no, obviously no mountains, lakes, oceans, but we're surrounded by fairly vibrant, the downtown core is surrounded by fairly vibrant neighborhoods, which is also quite unusual. What role did the revitalization of those neighborhoods play in, um, in, in uh, develop in the development of downtown, the redevelopment of downtown. I think the the cheerleaders, if you can say, for the neighborhoods have always been cheerleaders for a downtown also, because starting in the 50s with Frank Fetch, he was a city worker and discovers this neighborhood that they're t thinking about tearing down and wants to preserve it because it's not only it's unique architecture, but it was close. It was close to a lot of those amenities. You know, we had the theaters downtown, we had the museums downtown, you have all the cultural attractions that we like. And so we've always been, those of us who live in the central city area, have been very supportive and supportive you know, not just vocally, but with our dollars and with our feet coming into the downtown and, and partaking and being that first wave of people that come into things and, and promote them when they're happening in the downtown area. Um, I think it's uh, been a, it, it's a, it's not a, any one thing that has really helped those neighborhoods that have helped downtown also. It's been, it's been simple things like the police working to break up some of the gang activity in certain neighborhoods the deconcentration of some of the, you know, low income housing and giving those people options to live in other neighborhoods and have mixing it up a little bit has really helped those neighborhoods recover, which in turn provides a steady stream of people coming into downtown, you know, and shopping at the businesses and stuff that are opening up. You know, we've created some neighborhoods too when you look at what's happening in the arena district. Uh, with a new development in there and the residential population there. To a certain extent, the brewery district, that are some residents there, but to really kind of enhance that neighborhood. Um, and you know, I think that uh, when you look at the quality of the neighborhoods in the downtown and the quality of the housing stock surrounding the downtown, uh, they were really ripe for that kind of redevelopment, much like German Village. And uh, people do want to live in those neighborhoods. They want to be close to downtown. They want to have access to the amenities now that we have today. So we've built a couple parks downtown. You know, one, one, 
One was, <laughs> and we're going to build some more. <laughs> um, the, the one that um, particularly interesting was we had this dead and dying mall that, you know, I guess it was the other way around, dying then dead. Um, but the, um, you know, it was sort of a, it was sort of a crazy idea in a way to, to take a, a big building, you know, a million square feet and, you know, we're going to tear it down and do what? You know, we're going to build a park and uh, yet it's had a huge impact. So um, what, what, what can you say about that? Is it the park? Is it what goes on? I mean, how, what makes it? Well, it's all of the above. I think the, uh, I mean, not only was we tearing down a mall, we built it on top of a parking garage, which created all sorts of challenges as well in terms of building that, that, that the Columbus Commons is the park that you're referring to right now. Um, I think as, uh, as you look at these parks and the things that they bring, again, you need the residential population, you need to have activity, but you also have to have programming. I, I talked with uh, CDDC here the other day uh, who, who manages that park facility, you know, they've got over 250 events planned in that park this summer from picnic with the pops and food truck events to children's events. So it takes the programming and so on that, that helps to energize and enliven those parks because, you know, we don't do it with just the people that live downtown. Folks come back downtown for these facilities as well and these programs. The other thing I think that uh, is important to note with the commons and the, the real reason I think the commons was built was to spur other economic development. And now we have, and I can't recall the name of the apartment complex going in, but you know, it's really the new one. The new one. Yes, <laughs> it's under construction today. And, and, and some folks have come to me that said, you know, why are they taking park away now and building apartments? Well, it was always the master plan. The goal there was for that park to spur more economic development downtown. And I think it's even happened much quicker than most folks anticipated when that was done. So now you're gonna have another 300 apartments on High Street in downtown they are gonna front on that park. So again, parks and, and are a part of that formula, but they create that economic value that help to spur that other development. Uh, an example that's thrown out all the time is the amount of money that was spent in Chicago uh, on the park development there, but the, and I, I don't remember the numbers, but the amount of economic development that has occurred in Chicago as a result of the Millennium Park is just beyond belief. It's just huge numbers. It's actually and the number one tourist attraction in Chicago. Is, it right is, now. it is. It's yeah. like so place, it's uh, a great uh, museum, but they all go to yeah. the park. <laughs> well, Chicago's a different city in Columbus. It's hard to compare the two exactly, but there is real value uh, uh, brought about by that kind of public investment then that spurs that economic development. There's actually another building site which is uh, more office space on the Columbus Commons that's set aside that ultimately the goal is that that be developed as well uh, with an office building. So, um, you know, you've got the parks, it creates that open space, it creates that venue for folks that live there, but you've got to program it and then you know, there's those benefits, the economic benefits that come along with it. Any thought about the impact of the parks, Jeff? Well, the programming is an amazing thing. Um, I'll tell my little story about we do our bus tours. Um, we've done bus tours now. Um, I've done them for about six years for the Historical Society. And we do them both on a Saturday morning for the general public, and then we'll do private tours. Um, first couple years, we started offering the, public, the private tours. And I would get a Friday afternoon tour. I'd be, oh, gee, it's going to be a pain to get through downtown Columbus because of the traffic and everything. Um, and because Saturday morning, I'd come down, you fly through the city. Open roads, these are designed for, you know, lots of cars coming in and out, and there's nobody here. So it was very nice and very quiet, and we got around. Um, not so much anymore. Uh, <laughs> last year was the culmination of, I don't know how many paving the way notifications I got of street closures at the last minute that we had to figure out how to get around. People trying to get down to COSI, um, where we're located, where the tours start, you know, to get on them. But it's been great because it's amazing to see the change. That's where this whole kind of playground thought came out of was because People are coming down and playing on the weekends. Uh, if Saturday night, you, you get out and there's a concert going on down at the Columbus Commons and you're just driving down the street to go to dinner somewhere else and there's you know, people everywhere. And it's amazing to see the change and, and in my time in Columbus, how much people have come downtown after hours and on Saturdays you know, for a walk or a race or a run or something. And, and that is also spurring people to want to be downtown because the programming of those people coming downtown, there may be a couple of those people who say, hey, this isn't such a bad place. It's not so scary. Um, maybe I want to eventually you know, downsize and move to an apartment here or move to one of the nearby neighborhoods so I'm close to all of this. It's really, I see in the last six or seven years, really just kind of exploded 
with the growth and um, the completion of the site at a mile. Go to Milestone 229. There's people 24-7, 365 on that park, running, walking their dogs. Doug really wants you to go to Milestone 229. <laughs> I know, I'm not, I, I, it's not an advertisement for them, but you know, just sit in Bicentennial Park and, and look at the traffic out there. It's been amazing, the growth that, that we've seen. Um, and people just having fun. What about the programming downtown, Alan? I mean, well, it, the programming's taken off, and, and, and again, part of it is folks do just want to come down. I'd hazard a guess if you went down on the promenade today on the side of the river right now, all the tables and the benches are going to be full, and the swings that uh, Keith came up with, and the, and the little trellises we have there, they, it's hard to get a seat. You almost have to take numbers to get those now. But the, the programming really has taken off, and, and I've told, uh, and I've brought it up in cabinet with the mayor a couple of times, I think we're the victim of our own success to a certain extent. Uh, the amount of requests that we get for events downtown now have skyrocketed. One of the things our department does, we don't produce all the events you see downtown, but we do permit the events. So if you're using a park or closing a street, uh, uh, you have to come through our department, and we've had to change the rules now for races and runs because of the volume of requests that we're getting and the, some of the impacts we're starting to have. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been great to see what has happened as a result of the park development and people coming downtown, and people do see that it's safe, that it's an enjoyable experience, that there are things we can do. Um, and so now more groups want to have that, you know, so we're going to, I don't know if we're going to reach a capacity here at some point where we can't do any more runs, but, you know, we also maintain a, uh, a event calendar of all the programs that go on in the city, and if you look at that calendar, there is something downtown every weekend from this point into August, September, and October. If somebody in Columbus tells you they can't find something to do on a weekend, they are not looking very hard. There are things going on literally every weekend. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really kind of spurred that activity and, and, and growing. So <clears throat> um, what's the future of Del? What's, the, what, what's, what's gonna keep it being the playground that it's become? Um, what's the next big thing in the downtown area? Well, I think one, and, and, and Keith and I talked about this a little bit uh, the other day, and one of our former mayors, uh, Buck Reinhardt, uh, when I was talking with him and, and over the years, he made a comment to me that uh, cities uh, aren't stagnant. They're either um, moving forward and growing or they're going backwards. Uh, so we, we have to uh, keep that in mind. We can't just rest back and say now, sit back and rest and say, hey, we've achieved something. We can rest on our laurels and it'll all work out. We need to continue to look for those opportunities for development, for activity, for programming to keep people coming downtown. We've got to keep moving forward. I think the, um, um, you know, the opportunity exists for more development. The, the Franklinton area obviously is I think a very hot area in the city right now that's ripe for redevelopment. I know we're looking at some future development over there and some things are already in place. The west side of the river, I think there's still lots of opportunities there. So as we continue to look at the downtown, I think the west side will be something that's looked at very closely into how that can uh, be done. The other big project that's already underway is the Scioto Greenway project, which is uh, uh, the removal of the Main Street Dam. Uh, that project will actually start either late this year, or early next spring. Uh, it'll lower the river about uh, six or seven feet, narrow the width of the river uh, back down to about 250 feet closer to the original width, and create almost 33 acres of additional parkland downtown. So that's going to take two or three years to develop, but that's going to create more opportunity as well for um, uh, open space, for programming, for activities, uh, for, you know, just walking along the river. We also know today, you know, I think a lot of the decisions we made after the 1913 flood about managing the river maybe weren't the best decisions, but they were based on the knowledge we had today or at that time. Today we know that that created poor water quality, creating those dams, doing a lot of those things. So we're going back and starting to take out some of those dams. It's, not only will it create more parkland, it's going to create a healthier river in the downtown area. Uh, we want to bring some more uh, rowing, boating, canoeing, kayaking kind of activities downtown. So there's going to be a lot of that, that type of development that's going to occur in the next few years. And since Alan brought it up, let me um, <clears throat> make one brief um, sort of uh, public advisory. Don't be shocked when the dam comes out. It'll get better, okay? <laughs> there will be a time when you think this is the craziest thing that we've ever done. Um, but 
uh, in the end, it'll, it'll be terrific. So Jeff, from your perspective, what's the, what's the future? I, hopefully, I think we've created a, there's been a culture, a shift in our culture to some degree also. Um, as we've reached this critical mass of population and some traffic issues, we've got a new generation that doesn't want to deal with that. Um, if you drive around town, you'll see some new um, bike uh, parking stations, and coming soon, you'll see some bike share programs. There's a whole new generation of folks that are out there pushing bicycling as an alternative to the car. Um, they're more environmentally conscious, you know, they want locally sourced foods, they want to bike to work or walk to work because we have traffic issues now, you know, getting out 670 at 5 o'clock at night, you know, it's bumper to bumper. So uh, hopefully there's a whole new movement there of people that want to come back downtown. Um, and I think that'll keep going as we keep investing because that's always seems to be a leader. Um, as we invest, others follow and we inspire them. First, it was just the, the city-sponsored events that were happening, the arts festival and some of the um, music in the air programming and stuff that happens. And now we've got all these private groups that are coming and wanting to do this. So that's what I hope that we've got a whole shift now in people um, coming back and, and enjoying it. Um, another thing that, that has happened is the people now the younger population, the young professionals, they don't ever remember the city that we spoke of initially. You know, they're so far removed from that dirty place and even the crime issues in the 60s, you know, some of them, that um, they don't remember that. They come downtown now and all they know that it's a great spot, there's great restaurants, there's nightlife, there's activity and stuff. So hopefully they'll have a different impression of that over the generations and not want to flee so much but want to stick around this time. Great. Well, it's a CMC tradition to take audience questions. Um, it's our prerogative whether to answer them or not. <laughs> <laughs> the CMC films um, all of its forms for broadcast in the Ohio Channel and, um, and viewing on YouTube with a link on the CMC's website. Uh, if you have a question, please go to the microphone and introduce yourself. And we thank you for not making long editorial comments. So uh, first question. <laughs> I try to keep it to a half an hour. <laughs> I, I, my name is William Goldman. I've been here for a long time. I, I first became associated with Keith when he was young and very creative. Uh, Alan and I have known each other for years. I was a zoning attorney. I was chairman of the Parkland Dedication Ordinance uh, Committee uh, that brought that ordinance to play and I think it's been a fit of recreation and parks. My only connection with Jeff is I'm becoming historic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the challenges that, that, haven't, that has not been addressed is there are 6,300 of us in the downtown area. I am president of the Waterford, Con Water Waterford Tower Condominium Association. Uh, we're 300 people who were pioneers. Jack Wallach built our building 25 years ago. Uh, Bicentennial Park has been a, uh, a hub uh, next to us. It's created some problems for us in relationship to the tranquility that we once knew. Now, I think it's wonderful that people are coming back into the downtown area, and we welcome that. But they're coming into the downtown area, which has become more residential at the mayor's direction, and they're leaving. Uh, and while they're in our community, we'd like them to take note that there are people who live here. Uh, and and uh, while we're willing to uh, invite people into our community, we'd like to think that it's a partnership, a partnership with Recreation and Parks. We've spent a lot of time with Alan. Uh, we'd like to think that, that there's something we can do to make that formula work. Keith, what would you advise? What would I advise? <laughs> <laughs> he just fills them. I, I, <laughs> I don't know what I'd advise. So they, that's a good question, Bill. I mean, I think in some ways, Alan said earlier, we're a victim of our own success. I think in, in a lot of ways we are. I mean, I had my own frustrations um, just trying to drive around downtown the other day when the race was on, you know, like, oh, really, one more road race? <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to get over across the way. But I think it's really twofold. I mean, one is, um, you know, the future is not the past, and it, things are going to change always. And um, <clears throat> there, part of it is acceptance of that, and part of it is also an awareness that there's, um, you know, there is a, a large resident population, and um, there's certain sort of civil um, rules of behavior that, that go with, you know, um, how you act in the public realm and how you act in public and 
and how you um, respect people who have made, you know, arguably an investment in downtown and, and have a very, very important role to play. Um, so I, I think it's both, you know, a certain degree of acceptance and a certain degree of behavior, um, civil behavior in, in, in civic spaces. And um, uh, hopefully that, that will, we're on a learning curve maybe on both. So. Would, you, would you recommend an active dialogue between public and private sector? Well, always. Yeah, I think always that's, that's important. You never get anywhere without that. So. Any yeah. neighborhood that goes under transition goes through this. It's not just downtown, it's, it's people in the Near East Side, the original pioneers in German Village, you know, they have concerns as the neighborhood changes and grows. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see when those apartments get filled on the Columbus Commons, how those people react, because they come in knowing that there's gonna be concerts at their back door. It's a different scenario for them, and they're coming down knowing all of this stuff. So it'll be really interesting to see how they deal with things. I remember that- I don't like it all. <laughs> yeah, I remember the, con the, the, the arena district, because it was, or not arena district, the brewery Board district, because it was growing, and changing and the complaints of residents because of all the bars down there. I mean, it, it, it happens everywhere. And we recognize there are challenges there and uh, we're trying to work through them. I think we were all surprised, especially by the success of Bicentennial Park. I don't think anybody expected the kind of volumes that we're getting there. So, um, you know, we're still talking about some things and continue to look and we will continue to have dialogue and, and try to figure out that balance somewhere. Question? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Bill Lafayette, owner of Regionomics and CMC board member. Um, a really sour way to ask this question is, what about downtown most disappoints you? But I think the way I'd rather ask it is, what about downtown would be most helpful and important to change if you could? Um, that, that is a tough one. Um, you know, the traffic, I think you know, we're trying to change the culture downtown in terms of transportation, alternative transportation. Uh, we're creating more bike lanes, bike routes, uh, the bike share program you referenced. You know, and I think it, I don't know if it's something that I think shouldn't, should change. I guess I'm saying it, I think it'll, it will change, but it's a cultural shift that takes time to get folks to be more uh, acceptance of, of other kinds of transportation means, transportation methods, um, you know, more pedestrian friendly, more of a walkable city. You know, one of the things we talked about early on here today, you know, um, I don't know, people, pro if there's anybody from City Hall here may have gotten in their car at City Hall and driven the three blocks up here. If you were in New York City or Chicago, you would have touched your car for that kind of distance. So trying to get that kind of cultural change in how people move around and get around would be one of the areas that I think I still think we've got a lot of room to grow there. I don't like to focus on the negative, but I will say my biggest disappointment uh, whoops, was not keeping my microphone on. Um, my biggest disappointment really was the demise of the streetcar. Um, I thought a streetcar up and down High Street between probably the densest area of the city um, at Ohio State University and into the downtown um, would have been a great thing. And I was disappointed when I went. And, and again, not to focus on the negative, but where I see great opportunity is around Duff School Park, which is absolutely a beautiful park surrounded by surface parking lots, so the cars enjoy the view every day, and um, nobody else does. And I think it's a great um, potential development opportunity around there, and um, I've been disappointed that it hasn't been realized sooner, because it's normally we have to go build those parks, and that one exists. Question? Uh, yes, my name is John McKnight. I'm Alan McKnight's little brother, wow. um, which if I've been doing my job as little brother, he should probably be worried right now. <laughs> um, but no, my, my, I'll yeah, save my huckling for another time. Uh, my question is, how does Columbus compare to other comparable cities? Uh, Alan mentioned it's difficult to compare Columbus to Chicago, but there's a lot of cities around that probably you can draw an easier comparison to. Uh, is Columbus, as, as downtown Columbus being an attraction, uh, how do we rate? Are we, uh, are we above par? Are we leaders? Uh, do we have some catching up to do? Um, Thank you. I, I'll deal with that if you want, because I work in a lot of the cities around here. I think we're, um, we're not at the top, but we're, we're near. I think Pittsburgh has done an incredible transformation. Um, if you consider where it was and where it is today, um, really remarkable. Um, on the other hand, it, you know, you look at Cleveland. Okay, and 
you know, it's hard for me to say. I love Cleveland. I grew up there, but um, you know, it, it had a little bit of a rebirth in in the '90s, and it just backslid. And it's you know, it's still there's kind of a collective communal depression up there, and it's it's very hard to um, to watch. And they it, you know, they just it's hard to kind of get their legs. So I think Columbus is is really um, in a bright spot. It's it's not. Um, I think it's ascending. You know, I think Pittsburgh is is maturing in a, in a very real way. I, I think in a lot of ways, I would argue we're ahead of Indianapolis. Although I know people would argue with me about that um, because they did a better mall downtown than we did. Um, but uh, I think in in a lot of ways we are ahead of them. And I think Cincinnati is kind of a different animal um, because it's such an older and historic city, and it lives in the state of Hamilton County. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I think, and, you know, and, and the one thing I'll say about Columbus, and, and I, would, I don't mean this lightly because, you know, we, we work in these other cities and things, but <clears throat> you can get things done around here. You know, people, uh, there's, there's an attitude um, that's in the city right now where, you know, it, if it's an idea and it might be crazy or something, but um, people, there's a cooperation among the leadership, political, business, that, that you really, maybe it's a moment in time, maybe it's always been this way, maybe it'll always be this way, I don't know, but it's that way now. And I think it speaks well for the city's future. Hi, I'm Jim Coe from WCBE Public Radio, and you've uh, reminded us of what a good place downtown has become to both play and to live. Uh, it seems to me that the other component uh, to maintain that homeostasis would be jobs. And um, I just kind of wonder what the projections are for the next five or ten years of job growth uh, in downtown so that um, young people and older people can walk to work. Well, yeah, the one thing I'd point out is that there are um, over 3,000 people working um, in the arena district now that were not there. Um, and the um, uh, I think you're going to continue to see job growth in the downtown. I think it's going to be balanced with residential growth. Um, you know, the, the, um, but there's, the, it, the, the office market is reasonable. You know, I don't know if it's healthy, but it's reasonable at the moment um, in the downtown area. And we've added a lot of office space, and it's taken a little bit of time, but we've absorbed it. And um, I think you'll continue to see job growth. I think it'll be balanced with the, with the residential growth, which is probably a good thing. We have a very large area. We wouldn't want to fill it up with all residential. We couldn't park it to begin with. Question? Um, yes, I'm Susan Warren or Smith. And I just was interested in oh, what the projection was for providing just basic support for residents of downtown Columbus with the demise of city center, the closing of the Lazarus building, you know, where do you buy your groceries? Where do you take your cleaning? Where do you buy a pair of shoes? Um, already. You got Hills market opened up. Okay. I, there, I'm sure there are things that I'm not aware of. So I'm, I'm just interested. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, you know, say it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg, you know, you can't support grocery until you've got the residential there. And, you know, so the residential can't come in, you know, they're looking for the grocery, uh, those kinds of services, the dry cleaner. And I think you're starting to see that, you know, recently it was just what in the last month, two months, Hills market opened up on Grant Avenue, um, which is, and I haven't been there yet. I'm ashamed to say, but, uh, uh, it's done a, a real good business from what I understand. And so you're starting to see more of that develop, more of the storefront kinds of developments uh, occurring. So I think it'll come as, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a process where you add a little bit of residential and then you bring in some of that support and it, they start supporting each other and it builds and will continue to do that. Take a last, go ahead. I was going to say real quick, even if you live downtown, you still have to have a car pretty much in Columbus mm -hmm. and you drive to Easton and you drive to the surrounding areas for shopping and stuff like anybody in the suburbs drives in. Um, the uh, Kroger's in the brewery district, that was one of the first big grocery stores to come in to the downtown area and people drive, you know, I live out by Franklin Park and we go down there for shopping because it's a mile and a half from my house. Yeah. It's not that far. 
Um, so there are more in the outer core of the downtown area where people go out and ask any of the local residents and people of the downtown association. They'll tell you where their things are. And there's new ones coming online. There's another uh, gro little grocery store market that should be opening up, I think, in the next year downtown. We'll, we'll take a last question. And I just one, I, this is one of my favorite questions that always comes up about retail downtown. I'm just going to one comment that we have two great grocery stores around the edges of downtown. You're closer, if you live downtown, you're closer to a grocery store than most people in Dublin. Okay, and, and honestly, um, you know, I live in a little town where I could walk the grocery store. I wouldn't walk the grocery store on a bet, okay, because you have so much stuff that you're carrying out of there that, you know, it just, so there's, there's a notion of that. Now, the other part of her question, which is really interesting and much more difficult to answer, is what about the sort of service retail and things for, um, for downtown? She's asking about dry cleaners and things like that, and that is a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. I will say that retail has undergone a metamorphosis in the last, over the last recession. It's a very difficult business, um, and I just hope it comes, but it, you can't force it, and you can't subsidize it. It has to be market-driven. Last question. Yeah, Keith, I'm Max Moore from uh, Leadership Columbus, and she actually stole my question about the retail. I bemoan almost on a weekly basis that there's not a department store where I can buy a tie because I spill coffee on my tie like once a week, and, and there's no place in downtown yet. Um, but, I, but you're right, there's a um, pop-up. Um, I do want to echo Jeff's comments and say kudos to Keith and Alan for their work on the side of mile. If you would have told me 10 years ago that people on a day like today would be jogging and sitting at the benches and things, I've said, you're crazy. Um, and it is, it's active um, all year round. Uh, my question is, I guess, since my retail question got stolen, I'll ask the, the big elephant in the room question is the, uh, the role of mass transit in downtown. How far away are we? What critical mass does it take to get there? Do you foresee it in our generation or next generation? Where does it stand? All right. <laughs> How much time we got? I think cities have been shaped by the way they move people forever. And, um, the, you know, cities were shaped by um, the paths that they took ox carts through in Europe. Um, you know, and cities have been shaped by our decisions that we made about the freeways in the 50s. You know, transportation has always affected the form of cities, and it's a critical thing to consider. Um, there is, um, you know, is the chicken in it or the egg problem in Columbus? Is the density there to support it? Um, and what does support mean? You know, um, I think that to me, you know, I'm probably wrong, but I'll say it anyway. I think that one of the most heavily subsidized businesses in this country today is the trucking business. Um, because we spend billions of dollars on our freeway systems every year. Um, but the notion of a public transit, a, a something, a, some, what I liked about the streetcar was, you know, as opposed to light rail, which is a five or six hundred million dollar, it was a hundred million dollar. And, and there was, we have two pockets of density where you could imagine it. Um, I think we're going to have to, it'll take, it'll take some courage you know, for us to change that. And when we do, it'll change the city again. And it will happen. I don't know when. I wish it were soon. But I don't think it will be. Um, I, think, I think the leap is going to be a great one when we take it. And um, I, I just hope that we, we don't aim too high. You know, for years I've been hearing about light rail from Worthington to, to downtown. And, you know, I was driving in at 4.30 on a Friday and I see this sign at Polaris that says 14 minutes to 7071. You know, really, I mean, what do I need a light rail line for if I can drive at 4.30 on the freeway and be down there in 14 minutes? And I think we need to start small and we got to do it the way Columbus does everything. We just have to be smart and we have to take a chance. So thank you. Rich?